Oh, good evening and good day, everyone. I hope you had a wonderful day and now we are ready to learn some more, maybe ask some questions. Uh, this is time for you to have a look at our topic. As you know, we will talk about free software strategy and we have an expert. And if you've been through some webinars already, uh, I think you should uh, be familiar with Dr. Esther Marban. She is right here with us. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Marban. It's great to have you back. Hope you had, I know you had a busy day, but I hope you are ready and uh, happy to be here with us as well and are ready to present our topic tonight. How are you? Hi, Caroline. It's a pleasure for me to have the chance of joining you once again. So we hope that today's topic is also interesting for all our uh, patients and we'll, we'll see what happens today. Definitely. So as you know, we will start with the presentation, but afterwards there will be time for your questions. So all you need to do is just type those in the chat section. Dr. Marban will definitely help you out with those. So don't hesitate. I do expect another interesting Q&A session, uh, but that's after the presentation. And as you know, we will talk about uh, free zone strategy. So of course, Dr. Marban has a presentation on that. So she will walk you through all the aspects of free zone strategy. And then of course, we will have the Q&A. Before we start, let me just add that, as you know, uh, my AV Fence is a part of European Fertility Society, and we are simply here to help you with some questions and some answers, of course, but also to help you out with some other things like support, which is definitely important. And I also want to mention that if you are uh, someone who would like to contribute who would like to uh, perhaps help us out there is an option to volunteer and there is a link in our chat so if you are interested or you know someone who might be interested to help us out and grow uh, go ahead check this link or just email us and we'll be happy to give you some more details uh, plus I want to add there are some more events coming up as you know and there are also many events in English but there are also some events in Spanish, Italian, mm -hmm. and French. So if you haven't seen that and that's something that you might be looking for, I can only encourage you to check our website, myavifences.com, of course. Um, so that's just a brief information just to let you know. But I think that now uh, we can go ahead with our presentation. But before that, Dr. Marban, uh, thank you so much for joining us again. And I just want to mention that Dr. Marban is from Clinica Tambre. She's the gynecologist and fertility specialist, and we are happy to have you back for sure. And are you ready to begin? Sure, sure. Brilliant. Thank you so much, then. You're and welcome. So thank you very much, Caroline. So today's topic is freeze all IVF strategy explained why and when should I freeze my embryos? So what will we cover? First, we will talk about the definition of free soul strategy. Then we will talk about IVF procedure and embryo freezing protocol. We will also cover why and when is freeze all recommended, the strategic outcomes and conclusions. So what's the definition of freeze all strategy? It is a procedure by which all the viable embryos obtained after ovarian stimulation are cryopreserved. The embryo transfer will take place in a different cycle after ovarian stimulation. So it means that the patient will undergo the ovarian stimulation first and the embryo transfer in a different cycle that can be postponed one month or even more time. The improvement of the vitrification technique has been crucial to make this a daily practice in many IVF laboratories all over the world, since it increases the thawing survival rates and permits similar implantation rate with fresh embryos. In this slide, you may see how is the IVF procedure. So I, I guess that many people may know that First of all, we need to stimulate the patient's ovaries. That stimulation lasts normally for 10 days approximately. During those stimulation, we perform several ultrasounds and some hormonal tests to check how the ovaries are responding. Then we do the egg retrieval, in which we take the eggs from the ovaries. We fertilize those eggs with a patient or with a sperm donor sample, and we wait for five days. In a normal protocol, the embryo transfer 
DM takes place five days later, the egg retrieval. But in many patients, and we will talk and we'll discuss in what cases we recommend freezing all the embryos, the embryo transfer doesn't take place at that moment and it can be delayed until it takes place in a different cycle. So, why, why and how is the protocol to vitrify an embryo? So, the embryo vitrification is an ultra-fast freezing technique in which the presence of high concentration um, molecules and a very rapid cooling are required. Through this technique, the dehydration of the cell is promoted to avoid the formation of ice crystals inside the cells, which would damage the internal structures and cause cell death. So the embryos will remain frozen at minus 196 degrees Celsius in liquid nitrogen until the woman or the couple decides to use them. The embryos paralyze their physiological activity so that in the future they can be thawed and can resume all their functions. The embryo can be in storage for an indefinite time without losing the characteristics they had at the time of vitrification. It's really important to classify the embryos before, before being vitrified. It's crucial to apply the classification criteria cor correctly in order to freeze the good quality embryos. Otherwise, the chances of having a good survival rate could be decreased. So because of that, biologists normally pay attention and they uh, perform an exhaustive um, classification of the embryos in order to know exactly what, of the, what the chances of those embryos will be in terms of survival after being vitrified. So why and when is a freeze-all recommended? So first, and one of the most important um, causes why all the embryos should be vitrified is the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So that syndrome is such a trophic complication in assistive reproductive techniques due to an excessive ovarian response to the stimulation that may threaten the patient's life. There are two types. The first one is the early ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome that takes place between three to seven days after the trigger injection. The second one is called late ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome that takes place between 12 to 17 days after the embryo transfer and it's induced by the production of endogenous HCG during the pregnancy. The risk factors to have that syndrome is the polycystic ovarian syndrome, low body mass index, high ovarian response to stimulation, and also high estradiol levels on the trigger's injection day. Because of that, patients that have, are at a high risk of developing that syndrome are good candidates to um, freeze their embryos in order to avoid that syndrome. The syndrome could be mild, moderate, or severe depending on the symptoms and also blood alterations. In patients that suffer from a mild um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, they may feel their belly quite uh, bloated, they may also feel some kind of abdominal pain, and normally the, there is also, it could be also an increase in the, um, in the waist size. Normally the blood parameters are fine, so we don't find much alterations in the blood, um, in the blood but they can also have a more um, important syndrome like moderate one or also severe one that could also, as we mentioned, threaten the, the patient's life. In patients that have um, moderate syndrome, we could also find, apart from the syndrome that we have been talking about, that's also possible to find some alterations in the, in the blood tests. Uh, such as um, clot, well, a tendency to have a uh, trend to, to have clots uh, in the in the blood. That's also possible to um, to see patients that have some difficulties uh, in breathing. Of course, in the ultrasound, we may see that there is liquid inside the patient's belly. So we see like quite a high amount of liquid 
uh, surrounding the ovaries and also the uterus, and depending on the symptom that also on the alterations that we may, we may find in the blood, um, we can classify the syndrome between you know, mild, moderate, or severe. Fortunately, it's not very frequent to have patients affected by a severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome because nowadays, according to our protocols and thanks to the good beautification technique we have currently, in patients that have, let's say, a minimum risk of having a complication like that, we prefer to freeze all the embryos and do the embryo transfer afterwards better than taking the risk of doing the embryo transfer for, and you know, knowing that um, in the future, the patient may suffer that Fornaf syndrome and could be an issue for them. So we prefer not to be, well, to take the risk and we prefer to risk the, to take, to, um, to freeze the embryos in those, in that kind of patients. Another uh, example of why and when we should freeze all the embryos is in patients that are undergoing pre-implantational genetic screening. So when we want to test the embryos for several reasons, such as um, genetic illnesses that should be discarded in the embryos, also a potential alterations in the karyotype that we can also we want also to be discarded in the embryos. So in general, all patients undergoing um, PGTA need to freeze their embryos. The main reason is that apart from doing the stimulation of the ovaries and undergoing all the treatment as a normal patient, we need to test the embryos. So we need to do a biopsy of the embryos. We normally fix the cells and send those cells to the, to the genetic laboratory that we work with. So in order to obtain the results, we need around 10 days to obtain the results. And depending on then, of course, we can move forward for the embryo transfer. So it's quite normal to have all the embryos frozen in order to have time to receive the report from the geneticians with the results of that embryos. After that, of course, if we have healthy embryos to transfer, we can move forward for the next embryo transfer as usual. Another reason to freeze all the embryos is when we find a patient that has high serum progesterone levels on the triggers day. So we know that having an increase in the progesterone, the day, the day when we are using the trigger injection or also the day when the patient is starting the progesterone intake, could also be an issue in terms of implantation. So now we know that the high progesterone, serum progesterone levels um, are relate, is related to a lower implantation rate. So it means that when a patient is undergoing an ovarian stimulation or um, especially an ovarian stimulation, and if we find that high progesterone serum levels, it's highly recommended to freeze all the embryos in order to have, let's say, like good chances of having an ongoing pregnancy afterwards. Of course, um, patients that are undergoing a special cycle called dual stimulation should also freeze their embryos. The dual stimulation is a different stimulation in which we stimulate the ovaries in two different moments of the cycle. The first stimulation will take place um, with the menstruation as usual. So we will stimulate the ovaries as we normally do. As I mentioned, the stimulation normally lasts for 10 days. We do deck retrieval and then five days after. So five days after doing the egg retrieval, that's possible to restart a new stimulation. The aim of that dual steam is having the chance of getting a higher number of eggs in two different moments of the cycle. That um, Dual stimulation is especially indicated in patients that are, for example, undergoing PGTA in terms of having a higher number of embryos to be tested in a shorter period of time. Of course, patients that may suffer from a low ovarian reserve and want to keep a higher number of embryos can also undergo that stimulation. So as I mentioned, as we are starting a new stimulation immediately after the egg retrieval, it's not possible to freeze the embryos at that moment. So, sorry, to transfer the embryos at that moment. So we freeze the embryos and then we start the new stimulation with the aim of having a higher number of embryos to be transferred afterwards. Of course, any um, problem that may affect the uterus in terms of affecting the uterine cavity will also um, play a role in terms of... Um, 
of implantation and in that patient we should at least offer them the chance of freezing all the embryos. So sometimes when we are stimulating the ovaries we may find a polyp inside the uterus, also some mucosal, some mucosal fibroids and any other alterations such as thin endometrium or some problems uh, in the endometrium. So if that happens it's recommended to freeze all the embryos in terms of having good chance of implantation afterwards. Of course, if we see a polyp while we are doing the stimulation, that's possible to end the stimulation, retrieve the eggs, keep the embryos at the laboratory, and then have the chance of maybe undergoing an stroscopy with the aim of removing the polyp. So everything which is inside the endometrial cavity is uh, something that we are quite concerned about, and we should also pay attention to that in terms of removing the polyps or everything that can affect implantation in the end, with the aim of having good chance of implantation afterwards. The same happens with the hydrosalpings. The hydrosalpings is an alteration in the fallopian tubes where those tubes could be uh, would have some liquid inside them. Sometimes it's not so unfrequent to start the stimulation without having any kind of um, notice about that, um, that problem. And then during the stimulation, we can see that there could be some liquid inside the, the tubes. If that happens, the liquid could be toxic for the toxic for the, for the eventual embryos we are transferring. So because of that, we prefer to freeze the embryos, as we mentioned, do the surgery to try to remove the, the tubes to avoid any unnecessary risk and then moving forward for the next embryo transfer. And the, also the, the last uh, indication for freezing all the embryos could be adenomyosis. So the adenomyosis is a special uh, kind of endometriosis in which um, the uterus is highly affected. In many patients that suffer from that kind of problem, it's highly recommended to do the stimulation then keep the embryos and then use special medication to try to down, down regulate the hormones in terms of trying to, uh, let's say, do that adenomyosis not so active in terms of having better chance of implantation. So as that kind of endometriosis could also play a role in terms of implantation, at least in our clinics and following our protocols, we recommend freezing all the embryos and then waiting for two or three months with the aim of having the chance of using some medication to try to lower the chances of having a very active adenomyosis that could also decrease the implantation rate in the end. But it's also important to consider the aesthetic outcomes. As I mentioned, due to the good vitrification technique we have at this moment, we know that the survival rate of the embryos is really high, which is also important to consider. Because of that, we prefer not to take any unnecessary risks in, risk in terms of moving forward for an embryo, for a fresh embryo transfer, because we know that we have the chance of freezing all the embryos with good results. Apart from the pregnancy rate, that's also important to consider what may happen with all those pregnancies achieved after a, a frozen embryo transfer. So because of that, it has been many uh, and different uh, papers that have um, also shown us that the results are really good. And because of that, it's something that we also should consider in terms of having also the at least being relaxed in terms of what will happen with those pregnancies. So as you may see in this slide, so there are no differences in the cumulative birth rate between fresh and frozen embryo transfer cycles. So it means that there are no much differences in the potential babies that will be born after the fresh and the frozen embryo transfer. Apart from that, there is, as I mentioned, a potential benefit on the freeze-fall strategy on cumulative life uh, birth rate in specific clinical scenarios such as high responders. So as I mentioned, it is not it is not worth it to take the risk in patients that had a high response in the ovaries. Apart from that, patients that have the risk of having a hyper, an ovarian, hyper stimulation, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome are also good candidates to freeze all the embryos. As I mentioned, due to the good technique we have at this moment and due to what we know about the outcomes, 
it's much better and also safer for the patient and that potential pregnancy to freeze the embryos and then do the embryo transfer in a different cycle with the embryo having the, let's say, like the, the ovaries in a relaxed situation and move forward for the next embryo transfer in a safer condition. Apart from that, that's also important to consider that no differences in the miscarriage rate, there are no differences, sorry, in the miscarriage rate between fresh and frozen embryo transfer. And there are no differences um, in the risk of delivery before uh, 37 weeks of gestation, which is called preterm delivery, among pregnancies resulting from freeze-all compared to that ones that were um, obtained after fresh embryo transfer. It's also important to consider that no differences have been reported between the freeze um, all and the fresh embryo transfer strategy, sorry, the fresh embryo transfer strategies regarding other pregnancy outcomes such as the gestational diabetes, placenta previa, or antepartum hemorrhage, congenital anormalities, or perinatal mortality. So in the end, what we know is that freezing the embryos is safe for the embryo and also for the potential mother, which is also important to consider. Women in the free soil strategy might have an increased risk of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. It could be related to um, the endometrial preparation during the artificial frozen embryo transfer cycle, but based on the results of the latest studies, it's unclear whether endometrial preparation is associated with increased risk of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy or whether there could be another explanation. So what we know is that when we do the embryo transfer, um, we should prepare the uterus so that the endometrial thickness, let's say, is in the best conditions to the embryo transfer. Many patients undergo that preparation in a natural cycle, which means that we don't add any external medication in terms of estrogens. So we just do a, like a follow-up of how the follicle is, um, well, the dominant follicle starts growing. And at the same time, because of the production of estradiol in that follicle, the endometrium starts growing. Some other patients undergo what we call an artificial cycle with medication. In that specific group of patients, it could be also, a, well, sometimes we may see that, as I mentioned, it could be like an increased risk of hypertensive disorders, but it's, it remains unclear. So we don't know exactly if there is something related to how we prepare the uterus or whether it could be also related to the frozen embryo transfer. But as I mentioned, it's exactly at this moment, it's quite unclear. So we can't um, have any like conclusions because of the, of the data we have at this moment. So as a conclusion, the free social strategy is currently an option in patients at higher at risk of worse outcomes after IVF, as we mentioned, risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, endometrial issues, etc. And for those who undergo PET, the improvement in the vitrification technique has been crucial to obtain good results afterwards. In general, no differences have been found in the aesthetic outcomes between fresh and frozen embryo transfer cycles. So because of that, as we mentioned in the previous slides, it's a daily uh, practice that we also we already have in our laboratory and that we perform almost every day. And thank you for your attention. So I'm open to all the questions you may have. Brilliant. Excuse me. Brilliant as always. Thank you so much, Esther, for uh, this brilliant presentation, for explaining everything here. I think it's pretty clear, <laughs> but um, of course, we are here for you. And if you have any questions, you know what to do. And of course, there are some questions ready. Uh, remember, if you have any questions or comments, just feel free to um, put those right here. And I think we can go ahead with those. Are you ready for the Q&A, Dr. Morban? Sure, sure. <laughs> That's our favorite part, as always. So, um, so always remember that uh, we definitely do our best. Dr. Marban will surely do her best to help you out. And the question for the first question is from Belinda: What is considered too high progesterone levels, which you say may impact implantation rates? 
So we consider high progesterone levels when they are over one nanogram per milliliter. Because in that moment, we know that the implantation rate could be, um, could be reduced. And because of that, we prefer to freeze the embryos. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for the first question, Melinda. And I will go straight to the question from Sebastian, the last one, actually. What is your maximum serum uh, progesterone level on trigger day? As I mentioned, it should be lower than one nanogram per milliliter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Thank you for the follow-up question here as well. Okay. Uh, general question. How can we improve thin uterine lining? Was a really good question and also difficult one. So, first of all, it's important to exclude potential factors that could also play a role in terms of endometrium. I mean, sometimes it could be infections inside the uterus. Also, patients that have undergone previous surgeries in the uterus could also have issues with the lining. So, first, we try, let's say, to improve the results in trying to increase the um, estradiol doses normally. So if it doesn't work, we normally recommend doing a stroscopy or a three-dimension scan with the aim of knowing better if there is something wrong inside the uterus. At that moment, we can exclude if there is any kind of you know, problem inside the uterus. And it's also recommended to uh, perform um, some tests in order to discard potential um, infections inside the uterus. Sometimes it's difficult to make the endometrial uh, lining be thicker. Many patients um, could be also good candidates in terms of trying to change the uh, preparation we normally do. So as I mentioned, we normally use estrogens, but some patients may also uh, can do the cycle in a natural cycle and it can also work quite well. And in some others, we can also use gonadotropins similar to the ones that we use to uh, stimulate the ovaries, but in a lower dose, of course, with the aim of also making one or two follicles um, grow properly. And at the same time as they grow, they can also, um, it can also like uh, start producing estradiol that will also affect the endometrium. Some patients also have, you know, problems even with that. And we need to uh, find a different strategy in terms of having a better endometrium. Yeah, sometimes we need to add aspirin in a low dose, vitamin E, sometimes also some kind of medication that can that try to uh, improve the, uh, the blood that goes to the uterus. So in the end, sometimes it's very difficult. It's very difficult to have a good endometrium, to be honest. So we can do our best, but sometimes it's a matter of finding, first of all, the main cause, and then finding the best way for that patient to prepare the uterus. Thank you so much indeed for that question. And as you mentioned, it's always a difficult one. We did several webinars on that particular topic. Sure. Uh, but uh, thank you so much uh, for helping out with that as well. Um, okay, let's have a look. Belinda has another question, a bit of a longer question. And here it is. Mm -hmm. I froze all my blastocysts as it took me 10x retrievals to get 11 blastocysts over the last three years. We would only get one blastocyst per cycle, so we didn't do PGT. We did a transfer of two blastocysts last year, unfortunately had a chemical. We are now planning next transfer in September. We have seven blastocysts frozen. Do you think we should do single? Or double transfer, I am 43 in September. Well, I would suggest um, better than trying with one or two embryos, I would suggest to have those embryos tested first. So if Belinda um, has seven blastocysts, which is great, I would suggest, first of all, to do the test in the embryos as she is 46 years old. So we know that the potential chances of having a healthy embryo to transfer are around 12%. So it means that maybe one from all those seven blastocysts could be healthy or even more. But in the end, I, will, uh, I would suggest at least to defrost the embryos to the biopsy and then, and then uh, uh, freeze them again with the aim of getting the results from the geneticians in terms of having better chance of implantation. Otherwise, you can keep up, you know, keep up, um, keep on trying, you know, for several times. And in the end, I think it's 
and easier and of course it's more like reliable in terms of getting pregnant earlier to do directly the embryo transfer from the embryo that will give you the higher chances. So I would suggest uh, doing the, the, the test in the embryo, sure. Okay, thank you. I will go straight to follow up from Belinda, okay? But is there a risk of freezing, defrost, refreezing? If the embryos have good quality, of course, it's not, let's say, it's not the ideal situation, to be honest, but in terms of implantation rate, in terms of chances, and of course, in terms of time to pregnancy, we can do it. I mean, if the embryos are good quality embryos, they can tolerate the procedure of defrosting the embryos, doing the biopsy, and then freezing them again. Of course, it also depends on the, on the embryo's quality. As I mentioned, it's really important to classify the embryos properly in order to know exactly what the chances of survival are we are from them from those embryos. So in the end, it's important first to classify the embryos, and then, as I mentioned, it's possible to do it. It's not the ideal situation, but we can do it. And thank you so much of course, again for that follow up, for your questions, and indeed for your help with this. Um, and of course, thank you from Belinda for your go. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, let's have a look. Next question is up. Is there any technique uh, available that make it possible to recover the eggs after release, after your, they are released from yeah. the ovary when the oocytes go to the folds of fallopian tube? I'm afraid there isn't. I mean, it's impossible to know exactly when the, the ovulation may happen unless we do, well, of course, we normally use a special medication to make the ovulation happen in a specific moment, but it's impossible to know exactly when the egg will go out from the, the ovaries and will be um, taken by the, by the fallopian tubes. What we can do is the normal procedure. We go directly to the ovaries, take the, the eggs from, from them, fertilize the eggs and do everything that should happen in the fallopian tube will happen in the laboratory and then we push the embryo back. But I'm afraid there is no, let's say, new technique in order to, to do that. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, right? Yeah. <laughs> Still, uh, unfortunately, this is not possible, but thank you so much for the question here. Um, and let's have a look. Karen has another question on progesterone. What is the level of progesterone that is a risk for embryo transfer? When should this be measured? I would really like to read, the, read studies on this. Can you advise of any? Sure. I mean, so as I mentioned, the highest progesterone level should be one nanogram per milliliter. So um, the main reason is that it has been proven that when the progesterone is over that um, that level, the chances of implantation of the embryo are reduced. So in the past, when I started, when I started um, doing all my, my job, we didn't measure that. And we didn't know that it was important. So now we are completely conscious about that. And we always measure that. So the moment when it should be measured is the day when the uh, trigger happens. So it, it's normally two days before the embryo sorry, before the egg retrieval takes place. And if the embryo transfer takes place on blastocyst state, it would be like one week before doing the, the embryo transfer, right? So generally we test the projection at least uh, in clinical tamre. We, um, we test the projection and also estradiol at the beginning of the treatment. And then in the end, when we are doing the trigger injection. So, well, uh, of course uh, there are many studies and I can <laughs> give them but it's quite easy because it's as easy as, as you know um, trying to find on the internet uh, saying high progesterone levels and I'm sure that they will they will have more than I don't know 10 or 20 uh, papers uh, talking about the progesterone level and, and the, how important it is to be checked okay that's of course again thank you so much uh, for that and uh, just let me go to the follow-up okay from Karen as part for, of frozen embryo transfer when should progesterone be tested um I mean so we as I mentioned we always test the progesterone at the beginning of the cycle and also in the end when we are also scheduling the egg retrieval when we are talking about frozen embryo transfers 
and um, we are doing a natural cycle. We always test the progesterone before giving the patient the trigger injection in order to start produce uh, to, to, to start producing the, the natural progesterone. And we also test the progesterone in patients that are undergoing an artificial um, cycles before adding the, the vaginal or subcutaneous progesterone. Uh, because as we mentioned, it's really important to uh, clarify if, the if there is a progesterone rise or not, as the results could be, could be lower in terms of implantation. So we always test it before moving forward for the embryo transfer. It doesn't matter if it's a fresh or a frozen embryo transfer. And again, thank you so much for the clarification right here as well. And more questions are coming up. The general one right here, how is adenomyosis detected? Sometimes it can be detected with a normal uh, scan that can be performed at the consultation. Some others, it can also be detected by an hysteroscopy. So sometimes we may do the hysteroscopy for a different reason and we can see like a small implants of endometriosis inside the uterus. And the most common situation is that at least according to our experience, we have many patients that undergo 3D scan, three dimensions scan. And in that specific scans, we are able to see that like a small implant or implants of adenomyosis. Sometimes even um, having a, let's say a mild adenomyosis, we can also see that the muscle of the uterus is quite thick. And because of that, the uterine cavity could be reduced. So it's not only having a potential adenomyosis, but it's also related to, let's say, the place where we are leaving the, the embryo. It has to be, it has to have like, let's say, like big enough to accept that embryo. And because of the adenomyosis, sometimes if the uterine and the muscle is thick, sometimes the, um, the uterine cavity could be also quite reduced. And because of that, um, we also should consider doing any kind of surgery to try to wider that, that um, endometrial cavity. But normally it can be detected with a vaginal scan, a normal one. Okay, again, brilliant. Thank you so much. And again, before I go to the next question, let's go to follow up from Karen. So helpful, thank you. That's Emma Alice also tested the detect, sorry, the pneumiosis. I'm a friend. I'm a friend. They, they don't. So Emma and Alice will um, give you important information in terms of um, potential infections inside the uterus and also what we call the microbiome, which is the, um, the good bacteria that should be inside the uterus. But the M analysis doesn't, doesn't detect a potential adenomyosis. So sometimes, as I mentioned, it's a matter of doing a special scan or also a normal scan. And of course, if the patient suffers from um, endometriosis, we should also consider that it's quite likely that the endometriosis is also affecting the uterus. All right, thank you for the clarification once again, of course, right here. Okay, um, one more from Karen, sorry. It's right mm -hmm. here as well, sorry. Uh, when you say dual stimulation can be suitable for low ovarian reserve patients, is this cumulative or because luteal phase can have improved results over the initial phase of stimulation? Sure, actually we recommend dual stimulation in patients with low ovarian reserve because we expect not a high number of embryos in the, at the end of the, of the protocol. So it's a highly recommended in patients that for any different reason may expect a low number of embryos at the end of the, of the stimulation. So it's true that normally the luteal phase, um, let's say works more or less the same as the, the proliferative, the, the initial phase. But we have many patients that obtained better results in a luteal phase. So in the end, it's a different way to stimulate the ovaries. The ovaries are in a different moment of the cycle. And we don't know exactly um, the main reason, but in the end, what we see is that some patients obtain a better and higher number of eggs in the luteal phase stimulation than in the previous one. So in the end, we are quite used to, to doing that stimulation to our patients and we are happy with the results. In the end, of course, if the ovarian cervix is really low, we would not expect suddenly like a complete change. But in the end, 
we are able to retrieve a higher number of eggs and potential embryos in a shorter period of time, which is also important for our patients. All right, thank you so much. And one more, okay, let's go to this one. So is the luteal phase com commences 10 days after egg retrieval? No, it starts five days after the egg retrieval. So we normally, for instance, if the egg retrieval takes place, let's say today, which is Tuesday, the dual stimulation and the second stimulation should start on Sunday, which is five days later, the um, five days after the ovarian stimulation happens. All right, perfect. Uh, I hope that was helpful for you, Karen. Thank you so much for the follow-ups. It is, as I mentioned, so <laughs> thank you so much indeed. And uh, let's go ahead. Many, many questions are coming up. So how about this one? Is there some risk to freeze an embryo if you are older than 44? It's not only the matter of being 44 or, or 40 years old. The main risk is related to the quality of the embryo. So as I mentioned, if the patient is 44 years old, but if the embryo has a good quality, um, the chances of having a good survival rate are really high. Of course, it also depends, apart from the quality, on the laboratory expertise and also uh, on, you know, all the, how the stimulation went. So in the end, it's not only a matter of age. Of course, age matters. Apart from that, we also should consider the quality and how the laboratory normally works, their protocols and so. But in general, like we said, it's much more important than uh, how, let's say, good quality the embryo is. Thank you again for the explanation. Sebastian has a question here. Is salpingectomy an alternative salpingectomy in hydrosalpings? <laughs> So the salpingectomy is a technique to remove the, the tubes and the salpingostomy is a different technique that we do like a small hole in the tubes to avoid the liquid, the liquid sorry, go out. So currently, um, all the protocols uh, say that it's much better to remove the, um, the tubes in order to, let's say, to get rid of the problem. Otherwise, if we do a small hole in the in the tube, the liquid can go back again, and in the end, we will be starting from the beginning. So normally, if let's say the patient doesn't have a, uh, let's say like a very high risk of undergoing a surgery, we prefer to do a, a laparoscopy and have the chance of removing the the, the tubes. I hope that was again helpful. I believe so. Uh, so thanks a lot. Um, okay, let's have a look. Next question: Do you prefer free in freeze all cases to freeze all sites and then refroze and fertilize to transfer fresh embryos, or to freeze embryos and then defrost and transfer? Of course, it depends on the patient. We are talking about patients that want to get pregnant in a short period of time. If it's the case, I would suggest to freeze embryos better than, than eggs. The main reason is that eggs are like more um, yeah, sensible in the end about uh, because they are just one cell. And the vitrification could also uh, should be like very, let's say, um, careful in terms of obtaining good results. And in spite of, you know, having uh, those good results, it's better in terms of implantation and so to freeze the, the embryos. The embryos uh, may have like a, a higher implantation, sorry, survival rate first. And then if we are talking about a patient that doesn't want to get pregnant, for sure, we recommend freezing the eggs without any doubt. But in patients that are undergoing the treatment uh, for fertility because they want to get pregnant at this moment, we recommend freezing the embryos normally. Yeah, because the chances and the results are much better in the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great question indeed. Um, okay, let's have a look at the next question from me. So could you please shed a light on embryo's quality? How do you select the best frozen embryo for transfer if you had 10 healthy, normal NGS, PGS tested embryos? Well, if someone has 10 <laughs> healthy embryos, well, it could be great. <laughs> but uh, of course... Um, 
I'm the gynecologist and we are always in touch with uh, our laboratory staff. So they classify first the embryos related to how they develop into blastocyst stage. So since the eggs are fertilized day by day, the biologists um, check the embryos in terms of quality. So when we talk about quality, we talk about the, the potential um, small pieces that the embryos may have. We also talk about how regular the cells are, how the cells are dividing, and when they reach the blastocyst state, we classify the embryos depending on how expanded the blastocyst is. So the more expanded the blastocyst is, the better for the quality of the embryo. Apart from that, we also classify how the inner mass cells are, is, sorry. So we know that the blastocyst has like two different parts. The part that will be the baby in the future is called inner mass cell. And depending on how regular it is, and you know, uh, the, the biologists normally tell us if it's a good quality embryo or not. And we also classify the external cells, which is the trophectoderm that will be the placenta in the future. So considering expansion and also the quality of the inner mass cells and also the external part of the embryo, the biologists give us some advice in terms of, you know, classifying and saying, okay, that embryo that is also healthy should be the first one to be transferred. So they check how the embryos developed. And then they also give us like a, let's say like a, you know, like a list of embryos to be transferred, the first one and then the others. So the best one would be the first to be transferred and then they will be the others. All right, brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Okay, next question here. Is it true that you should not do genetic testing on embryos when you are 43 plus and have only one normal embryo as it can break the embryo? Well, as I mentioned, if the embryo is a good quality one, it can tolerate the procedure of doing the biopsy. But it's true that it's an invasive technique and in the end it also has uh, its risk. So it's not completely, let's say, 100% sure that any of the embryos will, will, will be damaged. But if the embryos that we test are good quality ones, the chances of having good chances of, uh, you know, of tolerating that procedure in the embryo are quite high. So in the end, um, when the biologists uh, that work at the laboratory say, okay, that embryo is not suitable to, to be tested, it means because they know that the quality is not high. And apart from that, that the chances of not being, of not um, uh, tolerating that procedure are quite high also. So in the end, they always give us an advice in terms of saying, okay, that embryo can't be a uh, biocide because we know that it won't be tolerated by the embryo. That's understandable, of course. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's have a look at this one, okay? For Maria, I'm planning on shipping my frozen oocytes, ship them to another clinic, fertilize them in, with frozen sperm and do NGS. Do you think there is a high risk of them not surviving the thawing? Well, here is an, a different factor, which is also shipping the diabocytes. So if that uh, transportation is done, let's say, in the same city, it's a quite safe procedure, but if the oocytes have to go, I don't know, from UK to, let's say, to Denmark, for instance, of course, the risk will be higher in the end. So depending on the, uh, on, you know, the international, well, so if it's from Europe to the USA, the, the risk could be also higher in terms of that. At least for me, I'm quite concerned when a patient tells me, okay, doctor, I want to have my 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 eggs or my embryos sipping to, uh, sip to, you know, to the place where I'm living now, because in the end it's a risk. If something happens during the sipping of the embryos or the eggs, in the end it could be an issue because if the temperature suddenly rises or if there is any kind of problem with the transportation, in the end, it can also affect the, the quality and also the survival rate. So let's think that, let's think positive, as let's think that the embryos and the eggs arrive to the clinic in proper conditions. Um, the, survival, the survival rate should be high if, of course, if the laboratory follows the protocols and thinking that the eggs, uh, were also good quality ones. So if everything, you know, 
is, let's say, in a positive way, the chances are high. But my main concern is that what may happen during the sipping of the of the eggs, because it's quite a, a long trip. All right, Magam, thank you for your question, Maria. Do let us know. I do believe it has been helpful. And there's a thank you from Maria for you right here. Um, okay, uh, let me have a look. More questions are coming in. And here's the next one from Sarah. I have premature ovarian insufficiency and have two eggs that are going to be in frozen to create embryos. Is frozen embryo transfer still recommended in a patient with premature ovarian insufficiency who has a little as two embryos? I think that in that patient, as uh, she froze the, the embryo, the, sorry, the eggs, I think in advance, I would suggest to move forward with a, with a normal, with a fresh embryo transfer. I mean, so it's, I think that we are not adding any benefit to the fact of freezing the, the embryos. So uh, let's think that she um, did the, the, the vitrification of the eggs when she was young, or at least younger than now. So unless the patient or uh, Sarah wants to, to have the embryos tested in the event that that happens. Um, if that's not the case, I would suggest to, to do the, the fresh embryo transfer without freezing the, the embryos because we are not adding any benefit to the treatment. All right. Thank you, Sarah, for the question. And um, more questions are coming up. So let me go straight to... Next one, before that, Sarah would like to th say thanks as well. Uh, thank you, indeed. Oh, and um, let's, uh, sorry, just give me a second. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> many, many of those. How are frozen embers selected for, tr oh, sorry, I think we had this one already. Yeah, it's from Biso about selecting embers. So I think we did it. Yeah, um, excuse me. So let me just go to, this one. There is more papers released now saying PGT testing is not 100% that some mosaics can self-correct so there is a risk we could waste be wasting embryos that had a small chance. This is why I'm uncertain about PGT testing. The results are not always accurate. What are your thoughts on mosaics? Well, it's true that um, the mosaics are there first, and it's also true that we know that the mosaic, maybe some people want to know what is a mosaic, but the mosaic embryos are those embryos that after being tested have some normal cells and they also have not uh, some no, no like altered cells. So depending on the chromosomes affected and also depending on the number of cells affected by the alteration, in many occasions we can also transfer those embryos. What we know is that in many occasions, having some alterations in the external part of the embryo doesn't mean that the embryo is also affected by any kind of problem. We know that because there are many babies that were born after being mosaic embryos. And what we know is that it seems that the inner mass cells keeps, let's say, like the healthy cells and push the non-healthy cells to be in the placenta that in the end will fit the baby and they are not needed to be part of the baby itself. So it's true that the mosaics are there. We find them when we test the embryos, but in many occasions, if the um, chromosomes affected are not high-risk chromosomes such as sexual chromosomes, chromosome number 21, chromosome number 13, or even chromosome number 18, we move forward for the embryo transfer with good expectations. So in the end, what we try to do when we do the test, that PGS, PGT, um, in the embryos, we are not thinking about the mosaic. We are thinking about the potential unemployed embryos, so the non-healthy ones. So many patients are quite concerned about the potential risk of, um, of doing embryo transfer with an altered embryo that may be affected by many different um, genetic problems. So in the end, it's true that the mosaics are there. We see them every day at the consultation, but many of them can be also be transferred in the end. So the risk is there, but we know that this is not related to age. So it doesn't matter that you are 40 years old or 30 years old. The mosaic rate is exactly the same and it's related to age, but it's not the same with the non-healthy embryos, the non-healthy embryos, the unemployed embryos, 
um, rate increases as the patient gets older. So in the end, what we try to diagnose is the non-healthy um, the non healthy embryos. Excellent. Thank you so much indeed for the clarification. I know that uh, sometimes uh, there are lots of questions on the mosaics and it's confusing at many, many, many times. Yeah. So thanks a lot for bringing this up as well. Um, okay. Let's have a look. Amanda has a question for you as well. In a medicated frozen transfer, when should this be transferred? Is it just standard or should uterus lining tell when to do this? Well, normally it takes like three weeks between the menstruation comes and the embryo transfer. But it's true that not all patients are the same. So the idea is that First, we need to check that the uterine lining is doing fine. So normally, if it takes like 10 days, 10, 10 days to two weeks time to uh, have the endometrium ready. And then depending on the embryos, uh, the embryo transfer, sorry, the embryo's day, we may decide when to the embryo transfer. Of course, if the embryo has three days and it's not a blastocyst, um, we need three days of progesterone. However, if the embryo is an um, blastocyst embryo, we need five days. So it will also be added to the other day that we were doing the embryo, the, the endometrial preparation. So that's also important to consider that if the patient has undergone any kind of test to have more information about the window of implantation, sometimes the time when the embryo transfer should take place could be could change in the end. So if we need to add some more hours of progesterone or should we should like remove some more hours of progesterone, it could also be related to how the, um, well, to what that, um, that test will tell us in the end. So it's not only a matter of saying, okay, it's just a standard. Of course, some patients undergo a standard protocol, but in many occasions we have to change slightly what to do. All right. Again, thank you so much for yet another question and help with that for sure. Okay. Um, Karen has another question for you here. Let's have a look. So is there any test checks results to be observed before commencing dual simulation commencing after the five days or just starts after five days as it may not be possible to detect follicles have reliable results at that point? So normally, it starts after five days. But it's true that at that moment, what we find in ultrasound are the corpum, the luteus corpum from the previous cycle. So we see like the hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic um, cyst from the previous egg retrieval. Sometimes it's really difficult to see the small follicles. But what we normally do is that patients that we know that are undergoing dual stimulation, we try not to uh, do the egg retrieval from the smaller, uh, the smallest follicles in terms of letting them grow in the next stimulation. So what we normally do is that we do a scan five days after the stimulation, and then we do if it's possible to, to restart a new stimulation. Of course, if we don't see any follicle, if the patient is not doing fine, um, any, you know, if we find uh, some, for instance, if the patient is not doing fine in terms of, you know, having any kind of symptom after the first um, egg retrieval, also in terms of uh, if we find that, for instance, there is some kind of free liquid in the in the in the belly of the patient, and so sometimes it's not possible to start it. But in general, we check that the ovaries are doing fine and we can start. So it's true that at the same time as the small follicles grow during the dual stimulation, the big the big ones that are like the rests of the other pregnancy start decreasing in size. So in size. So well, it's quite normal for us to, to see that. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Karen, I believe that was again helpful for you. And let me go to the follow-up, okay, from our previous patient, Amanda. Um, thank you. My lining is usually thick early in my cycle. So would day 19, 21 be too late in the frozen cycle? Or would I need only an error to check this? I mean, it's quite likely that 
uh, your uh, Emirates transfer takes place between uh, day uh, 19 and 21, which is like three weeks after, uh, starting with your period. So it's quite likely that it happens at that moment. The error test will give you information about the window of implantation. So we are not talking about lining. We are talking about the, um, the genetic expression in your endometrium related to implantation. But normally the, the embryo transfer, as I mentioned, takes place like three weeks after the, the, the menstruation. Okay, and while we are on ERA test, does ERA have to be done on a medicated cycle? No, I mean, so what we know is that if you decide to do the ERA test in a um, um, cycle with medication, artificial cycle, you should do exactly the same to do the embryo transfer. The same happens with the natural cycle. So if a patient wants to undergo a natural cycle to the error test, as the results are related to how the preparation took place, it's really important to follow exactly the same protocol that the patient uh, followed to do the, the, the mock cycle for the error after the, well, when they are trying to then retransfer. So it's not necessary. It has to be done with medications. It can be also um, be done with a natural cycle. Okay, crystal clear. Thank you so much indeed. Um, we have many, many questions tonight. So thanks everyone for joining in and for all the questions that you have here. Um, and uh, there are some more and I, th I think we can still go ahead with them, right, Dr. Morpan? Mm -hmm. um, I hope that's okay. Um, so can the quality be better graded when using an embryoscope? In the end, um the biologist may have like more information about the embryos. So it's true that we if you use any time-lapse um, device, the biologist will have the chance of knowing better and more about the embryos. So they can classify embryos that maybe they were not classified as good quality, knowing ex the moment exactly when the, the cells uh, are dividing, knowing exactly how the cells are doing during all the each day that the embryos are in the laboratory, they can know better and more about the embryos. And in the end, they also be able to classify the embryos properly. So in the end, the more information they have, the better for, for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And let me just go to some follow-ups, okay? So this is uh, in regards to era question okay era question sorry i just need a second here uh, i was told that unmedicated cycle can yield unreliable results because it is less it is less controlled is this true no it isn't i mean it's more difficult to to have an actual cycle under control that's true it's also true that the risk of having of having a spontaneous ovulation is higher than with an artificial cycle but Actually, at least in our clinic, what we do is that we do several scans and we perform those scans every two days approximately with the aim of uh, catching the, the ovulation before it happens. So uh, it's exactly the same um, than an artificial cycle. Actually, the, the, the scans we perform are uh, like more frequent. And we also test the progesterone, so it's exactly the same. So it, uh, it shouldn't be like less controlled than the, the artificial one. I could say exactly the opposite. It's like more controlled. All right, perfect. Uh, one more follow-up, okay? So let me, and thank you, of course. Yeah. Uh, from Karen, here it is. So just a quick follow-up. Don't all follicles, even small, die off after the initial egg retrieval, even if not touched during the retrieval process? Not all of them. What we know is that they're like different, like ways of follicular growth. And it's not it, uh, just the, the first one, I mean. So in the past, we thought that the follicles didn't grow um, after the proliferative phase. And now we have that there are like different ways of follicular growing. So in the end, it means that some follicles will die for sure, but not all of, the, not all of them. If the follicles are not have not been like pre-selected because of the medication, because they are not reacting to the medication, they will be there and they can be selected afterwards. So not all the follicles will die. Excellent. Again, thank you so much indeed for this question and follow-up and all the follow-ups indeed. Um, and let me just have a look. Um, and thank you from Karen. In the meantime, um, sorry, 
just a second, is a euploid, uh, euploid 5 a AA, sorry, Andrew, better quality if it's from a 40-year-old than from a 30-year-old, or is it the same? Well, if we're talking about quality, the quality is exactly the same because it's a blastocyst through four, uh, blastocyst 5 AA, which is like the top quality uh, blastocyst, but the implantation rate is higher in a patient that is 30 years old. So let's say that the embryo in a patient that is 30 years old is like more strong and it has higher chance of implantation in spite of being healthy. And also in a patient that is 40 years old. So, you know, age is really important. And if, apart from the quality, the, let's say the potential rate of implantation of that embryo will be higher in a patient which is uh, younger. Yes, of course. Thank you so much for that again. Um, okay, let me just have a look. Okay, more questions? Not sure. Here, just give me a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right, here it is. Uh, what is the sufficient but ideal amount of time to wait between fresh egg collection and error and then between error and frozen embryo transfer? So... After doing the, the egg retrieval, the patient should wait until the period comes. So at that moment, they can start the preparation, the mock cycle that we say, uh, to prepare for the ERA test. And then what the laboratory suggests is that the closest to the embryo transfer, the better. So it's, it's, it's true that the results are quite reliable, even like after one year of, being, of having done the, the biopsy. But... If the patient is planning the embryo transfer, let's say, I don't know, in December, so I would suggest to do the error test, let's say, in October or November, not before, because the results will be like more reliable then. Okay, thank you for yet another interesting question. Okay, um, how about this one? Again, quite interesting here from Karen. Mm -hmm. I have two frozen embryos from different cycles. I heard that embryos from different simulation cycles shouldn't be transferred together. Is this correct? I also heard that embryos can have negative impact on each other. What would cause this? I also heard that transferring more than one can increase implantation. So trying to weight up risks. Any advice? So regarding the first question, it's not uh, true that there could be any negative impact because of having embryos coming from different cycles. So I think that is not, it's not true for sure. Apart from that, what we knew in the past is that when we transferred two embryos in the past, because now it's quite likely that we transfer just one embryo, but in patients that transferred two embryos in the past, we thought at least that one embryo may help the other one to implant. It's true when we are talking about, let's say like intermediate um, implantation rate embryos, but now when we are talking about high uh, potential um, implantation potential implant, uh, embryos in terms of good quality blastocyst and also euploid embryos, we know that in the end, if we transfer two embryos, what may increase would be the twin pregnancy rate. So in the end, each embryo has like their own implantation rate. So if we transfer two embryos, it would be like they will add the implantation rate from the first one to the other. So we are not increasing the single um, uh, pregnancy rate, we are increasing the double one. And regarding the third question, I also heard that transferring more than, well, as I mentioned, you know, we now prefer to transfer just one embryo in order to, of course, reduce risks and also increase implantation rate. Yeah, of course, brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, for this again and let me have a look okay so when is there the greatest risk of an ember dying in the event of a freeze can you know if an ember died during freezing or is it only when it thaws that you know it well when they are uh, doing the, the freezing procedure the embryos are alive for sure so if something happens just after that it's impossible to know so normally the, the thawing um, survival rate is around, at least in our clinic, around a 98%, generally speaking. 
Um, what we normally see is that a small number of embryos sometimes don't survive and they see it when they thought the, the embryos not before. So the same day of the embryo transfer, we know that the embryos have not, have not survived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Okay, I think it's clear. Um, okay, let me just go to this one. Can the endometrium also be too thick for transfer? Sure, sure. And it could also be an issue. So in the end, it has to, to have a good a thickness between 7 and 13 millimeters maximum. But when the endometrium is too thick, uh, the results are not also um, not good. So in the end, if we see a very thick endometrium, we also cancel the, the treatment and we start from the beginning. Maybe we lower dose of estradiol or whatever, but sometimes we also need to check what's going on in the uterus to have such um, thick endometrium because sometimes maybe there could be a polyp inside the uterus or whatever. So we need to check what's going on. All right, again, thank you so much for the clarification. One more from Sebastian. Uh, do you also measure progesterone on embryo transfer day and how should it be? We always try to check the progesterone one to two days after, sorry, before the embryo transfer takes place. So we need to confirm that the progesterone has increased in terms of having good uh, progesterone levels in blood. Um, and it should, at least according to our protocols, it should be over 10.5 nanograms per milliliter. So when it's over that 10.5 nanograms per milliliter, we could move forward for the embryo transfer. If it's lower, and in the event that the patient is undergoing um, and using a vaginal progesterone, we recommend using also subcutaneous progesterone in order to increase the progesterone uh, level in blood. Again, okay. thank you so much indeed. Another question, follow up. I didn't see before, sorry about that, but here it is, of course. I had an, a follicle that was 15, 20, 12 millimeters at day five. The doctor said it was from the last cycle. Can an old follicle interfere with the next cycle and assume X on that ovary it set? It could affect. So in the end, when we see like a bigger follicle that we expect it, in the ovaries, we don't know if it could be like a rest of the previous cycle or if one of the follicles start, started growing spontaneously before it should. So in the end, we prefer not to start the stimulation in that mom, at that moment, considering that that uh, follicle could uh, can play a role in terms of, of results of stimulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, let me just, sorry, just give me a second. Um, yeah, sorry, but it, sorry, it's about the previous question as well. But if on transfer day, progesterone would be three, would you still transfer or cancel? I guess that means uh, three nanograms per milliliter. If it's the, the case, we would cancel it, but it's not very common to find it. I mean, because our patients, at least, they uh, perform the blood test one to two days in advance. So, in the event that we find a progesterone of three, two days before the embryo transfer, we have time enough of adding the subcutaneous progesterone and increase the progesterone levels. But uh, as I mentioned, we perf we don't perform the, the progesterone the same day of the embryo transfer with the aim of having at least the chance of increasing the progesterone if it's needed. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Let us know if that was uh, what you meant, of course. I think so, but... Just let us know. Sorry, one more from Karen. I didn't understand properly why does implantation rate increase with transferring one rather than two embryos, if you can just clarify. No, I was. I meant that the implantation rate is the same. What happens is that if you transfer two embryos, what uh, is increased is the, the, the twin pregnancy rate, not a single one in the end. So considering that the implantation rate is high, we prefer to transfer one embryo in terms of doing the, you know, the, the, the treatment in safer conditions also for the patient because having a twin pregnancy is not recommended in general, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Thanks for clarifying, as you can see from Karen. And Marie, Maria, sorry, from the previous patient has just added that the, I had the clinic, uh, the clinic said it should have been over 20, but transferred anyway, it didn't go well. So it's regards to the yeah. progesterone level. Well, of well. course, it depends on the protocols of his clinic. Maybe the, the, the units that the progesterone was measured are different, but according to our protocols, if it's over 10, uh, to 10.5 nanograms per milliliter, it's more than enough to move forward for the endotransfer. But of course, maybe the units that that position was measured could be different, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Indeed. Uh, there are a few questions left. We will be finishing slowly, but I think we still can have a look at them. Um, sorry, here's the question. Where is the, sorry, where is there, um, when is there, the highest risk for an embryo to die in the process to freeze or uh, can you know if an embryo died during freezing or is it only when it thaws that you know it i think that we did yeah. this question yeah, right? I apologies so. yeah. i was reading this and i knew that something was similar so. sorry about that um there are so many questions tonight which is something that we are happy about uh, but mm -hmm. it's just uh, something that i need to look at more carefully um, okay, sorry. I think that this is the new question I meant to ask. Uh, what is sufficient ideal amount of time to wait between a collection cycle and era and then between era and frozen embryo transfer? I think era here. I think I have already answered that, but as I yeah. mentioned, we recommend waiting for the period to come after the stimulation and then the patient may perform the era test. Um, in a trial cycle or also artificial one, and then the closest to the embryo transfer, the better. All right. And just to clarify, uh, sorry, not this one. Uh, does the ERA test result change after implantation, pregnancy? Well, in the end, uh, if the patient gets pregnant, we don't know. Of course, it also depends on time. On time. So, uh, and the pregnancy could also affect the, the implantation, uh, the, the window of implantation. Some patients prefer to uh, perform the era again after getting pregnant, but some others consider that, okay, I got pregnant maybe like two years ago, I, everything went fine, so they don't repeat it, but it can affect, it can affect. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. Uh, how about this one? The subcutaneous progesterone injections, are these taken daily or twice weekly? Is one better than the other? Uh, well, if it is subcutaneous um, progesterone, it has to be taken once every day or sometimes even twice every day, depending on the protocol. But it has to be used daily. All right. Thank you. A one more short one from Karen from previous patients. So would that apply if there was an early miscarriage in regards to the test, era test, right? As well. I'm, yeah, well, if, the, if it's an early miscarriage, I think that I wouldn't repeat it because if the patient got pregnant, it means that at least the window of implantation was in the correct place. Maybe then all their problems could also have play a role, but in the end, the implantation window should be, should be fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense, of course. Um, okay, let me just have a look. Yeah, Fran has another question here. Um, if two embers were to be transferred and one implants but the other does not, what happens to the one that does not? Does it negatively impact on the survivor of the one that implanted? Well, in the end, as they are like different embryos, they are in different places. If one embryo implants and the other doesn't implant, it doesn't affect negatively to the to the implantation and of course it doesn't play in role so the embryo will develop properly and so so it's you know the embryo is really small and it doesn't affect the other one okay perfect thank you so much indeed um and uh, i think that there are like two questions left and we will be finished so, so we, fi we will be finishing <laughs> so if you have anything else to add of course just go ahead type this in but also i just want to remind everyone that if you wish to ask something this is also possible to get in touch with uh, dr marvana her team at clinica tambra directly and i'm sure they will be happy to help you out uh, but in the meantime let me just um, show you this question from me so do you unfreeze embryos check quality select best embryo then freeze the rest again for later transfer is this uh, how it works can you 
No, shortly. no, no, actually, we classify the embryos first, and then they are frozen. Then once the biologists decide what is the best embryo to transfer, they defrost the embryo and check the quality again. So normally the quality doesn't change because of being frozen, but we classify the embryos in advance. And thank you once again for the clarification. And I think that with this will be our final question. It's again about ERA and let's have a look if you can clarify this, uh, this one for us. Um, when you said that we should uh, wait for one more period between the collection cycle and ERA, do you mean to ble the bleed two weeks after the egg collection or do you mean we should wait for another bleed? Wait for six weeks from collection before ERA cycle. I have been told that the bleed after egg collection and after ERA is not a proper period, so it doesn't count. It's exactly a normal period, I mean. So what happens after the egg retrieval is that there is a sudden drop in the hormone of uh, the fetus. And, um, you know, it's like a normal bleeding. So it's like the, the ovaries and so start from the beginning, from the moment on. So the patient can perform the test at that moment. Of, of Also, if the patient wants to wait for another bleed, that's also fine, but it's a normal, a normal menstruation. Of course, not exactly the same as a normal menstruation because it, it has been produced after the drop in the hormonal levels, but it's also menstruation in the end. Excellent. Thank you so much indeed. And as you see, there are thank yous coming up uh, your way. Uh, as I mentioned, this uh, there is one more question I think we can still answer. So does AMH have any connection to the number of follicles one gets in a given month? Sure. I mean, so the AMH is related to the body reserve and also the follicle, the follicle uh, count is. So in the end, everything is related. So a patient with high AMH normally also uh, have high uh, antral follicle count. So it's quite related, sure. That's understandable again. Thank you so much. I believe that was our final question. So uh, I guess thank you so much, everyone, for joining. It's been a great, great session with many different questions, but uh, we are happy that uh, you were able to join us here tonight and that you were able to get some information, get some useful answers, I'm sure. Um, and just to show you one more, okay, follow-up from Tina. Mm -hmm. This IVF, I had four fol follicles and 0 0.2... AMH, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, two months ago, I had 0 0.43, seven follicles. Yeah, sure. I mean, so both the, the antifollical count, it depends on the moment of the cycle, which is performance. So it depends on the, on the person who performs um, it and also happens to the AMH. So if the uh, patient didn't do the AMH in the same laboratory, it may change slightly, but the difference between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 is not is not high and it's not big. So in the end, the difference are quite quite small anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just as it says here, is it going? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it goes up and down. And yeah, sure. this is normal. Perfect. Yeah, normal. Perfectly normal. All right. Just one more, I think. So that's a my drop an approximate percent each month, each year. Yeah. Well, it's impossible to know. <laughs> what we know, it would be great to know um, yeah, how sure. fast the image will drop in a patient. But what we know is that it tells us how the patients already are at, at, at a specific moment. But we can't know in advance how fast or how quick there will be a follicular drop. So it's impossible to know currently. It's, it's individual, right? It's something that we cannot predict at least. Yeah, it would be great to, to predict. Yeah. For sure. If you knew, for example, well, in three years, yeah. right? Yeah. It would be amazing, for sure. <laughs> <You know. laughs> but unfortunately, we're not there. You never know, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, as we are on this topic, does AMH give any indication of quality? I'm afraid it doesn't. So we, you know, we know that AMH talks about quantity, amount of eggs, but not quality. The parameter which is more related to quality is age. In the end exactly all right thank you karen we don't mind <laughs> should mm -hmm. it should it be tested at a certain point in cycle no 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 <laughs> 
I mean, so no, it can be it can be tested at any moment of the cycle. We know that it doesn't uh, make any difference to be tested even with the menstruation or even with the you know the, in the middle of the cycle. So it doesn't it doesn't affect the AMH level. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Karen. That's not a problem at all. And in the meantime, we do have two questions. I think we can still answer, right? Uh, is there an ideal time frame between egg retrieval and transfer? So if we are doing a first embryo transfer, as I mentioned, if we are transferring embryos on blastocyst state, it should be five days. Otherwise, if the patient is undergoing a frozen embryo transfer, there is no difference in terms of a pregnancy rate uh, because of doing the embryo transfer before or afterwards. So time doesn't play any role in that in that situation. Mm -hmm. Olara, I hope that was again helpful. One more. I promise, I think. <laughs> so I had 32 follicles in the last cycle, but only got 11 eggs and two blastocysts. I also got a small amount of fluid in pelvis cavity. Would I be suitable candidate for dual stimulation to collect the smaller ones, or is it too risky? Well, it also depends on how uh, the patient is, go is doing in terms of if he has any kind of symptoms. So I guess that she had me 34. 32 follicles at the beginning and then maybe like 15 of them grow um, grew properly so in terms uh, it wasn't feeling too well so if the patient is not feeling well there is nothing to say so I, I wouldn't recommend undergoing an ovarian stimulation a dual stimulation then because in the end if the patient is um, is not going you know is not doing fine I think that it's not it is not worth it to take the risk anyway so you see try, if she had to uh, blast cyst embryos, I would suggest to stop then and then we start a new stimulation if it's needed, but not a dual stimulus. It would be too much for that patient. Understood. Yeah. Again, thank you so much indeed. Thank you for uh, from the patient for you as well for helping out. And let me just have a look. I just want to check, but it seems that that was our final question. No, sorry, Alara, just one more. <laughs> um, and uh, so let me go to this one. Is there anything particular that one should be doing within the five days between transfer and neck retrieval, special diet, etc., to enhance chances of implantation? Well, apart, of, uh, apart from resting the day after the egg retrieval takes place and adding the progesterone, the patient doesn't need to do anything more in general. So normal life and using the progesterone that the doctor mm -hmm. uh, would have recommended. And that makes perfect sense indeed. Um, okay, sorry, one more, Tina. Uh, what is a good size of follicle for an AP? Well, I guess. Yeah, yeah right, so I think. We uh, well, we normally um, recommend doing this retrieval when the follicles are over 17 millimeters mm -hmm. okay thank you i'm just waiting someone is typing i just want to make sure that we at minimum if you can add that minimum 17 <laughs> yeah. okay minimum 17 right okay good um thank you so much <laughs> yeah sorry about that um, thank you so much indeed. And as I mentioned, if there are more questions, I'm sure that you would love to ask more questions. Remember, there is a possibility for you to get in touch with Clinica Tambre directly. And I'm sure that you will be more than happy to answer some more of your questions. So thanks a lot for this incredible Q&A, Dr. Marban. It's always great. We know that when you are here, uh, the Q&A could take like a few hours. So thanks a lot <laughs> for joining and thank you for your patience indeed. Before we finish, anything else you would like to add? As you see, more and lots of thank yous are coming up your way. Yeah, no, I'm also so thankful for having the chance of a little, uh, answering so many, so many questions. So I'm always happy to try to help uh, patients. And well, it's also a pressure for me. So, you know, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. Definitely. And I love this comment. I need you to see. I wish to be inside Dr. Morban had to absorb all your information. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I wouldn't mind that myself for sure. <laughs> so um, thanks a lot indeed, everyone. I think that it's a, a great session. I believe it has been very, very thank useful for you. And this is why we are also here. Um, 
Dr. Marban, thank you so much for joining. It's been a great, great pleasure as always. And I'm looking forward to some more events. And as you know, there will be some more events. We will be back here next week. More, well, more events are definitely coming up on Tuesday, but we will also uh, be here on Thursday, next Thursday. Uh, so I hope you will be able to join us. And of course, uh, as always, prepare your questions, anything that you have in mind. We are here to help you out in any way we can. Um, Dr. Marban, I just, I'm looking forward to the next one. That's all. Well, that's all I can say, really. So thanks a lot, everyone. I hope you will have a wonderful evening. Dr. Marban also. Have a good and relaxing evening and see you very soon. I hope as well. See you soon, Carla. Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone. And take care. See you. Bye. Bye.